Hey y'all, it's Hannah and Jeremy. Join us as we embark on our week-long road trip to see the best of fall that New England has to offer. In this series, we will visit Salem, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine with our first stop in Salem to kick off Halloween. We knew Salem was going to be busy this time of year, so we did our best to make early arrangements to get the best prices and make sure that everything we wanted to do wasn't sold out. After casually driving by one of the filming locations from Hocus Pocus, the Robes Mansion, which was Allison's house, we found our way to the day's first stop the Witch House. This is the only structure still standing in Salem with direct ties to the witch trials and was the family home of Jonathan Corwin, a judge in the trials. Corwin investigated the claims of witchcraft that sparked the 1692 trials, even signing many of the arrest warrants. No video was allowed to be taken inside the witch house, but later we visit another 17th century house and tour the inside, so keep watching to see an example of the furnishings. We made our way through the old Salem Witch Village of Shops. During the month of October, this area comes alive with characters and fall decorations. The next stop of the day was the Salem Witch Museum. This museum offers an in-depth look into the history of the trials. The museum also makes a great correlation between how the same witch hunt behavior has been seen throughout history with various vilified groups and a hunt for humanity to find a scapegoat for their issues. The case was very nearly dismissed, but for a last minute accusation made once again by Mrs. Putnam. On the strength of that, old Rebecca Nurse was finally brought to trial in Salem on June 29th. Chief Justice William Stoughton presiding. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. To wrap up our evening in Salem, we took a tour with the Salem Witch Walk. This was a great chance to learn about the mix of historic witchcraft associated with the Salem Trials and the way that modern witchcraft has evolved into a draw for the tourism in the area. So we'll see if the music really wants to play because like I said, witches and, and electronics, we don't do the thing. So welcome, welcome to the Salem Witch Walk. Again, my name is Sammy. And I'm happy to welcome you guys to the Ancestral Garden. And by the way, 
Pictures, yes. Videos, no. You don't want all the muggles learning all the secrets. Because we visited in October, Salem was quite busy. For the next day, we picked a place that was a little bit off the beaten path for a more relaxed afternoon. The Saugus Ironworks National Historic Site is open seasonally and takes you straight into the 1600s colonial Massachusetts. The grounds include a restored 17th century black house, just like the ones in Salem, as well as a historic iron mill, forge, and restored water wheels. chicken coop. Remember the chicken coop. We'll come back and talk about that later. If you open the gate and the white for the fence, big chimney stack in the middle. All typical of English architecture from this period. What's distinctly American about it is all the wood. So to represent a typical provincial English dining room. So typical features for the period are a big table in the middle of the room, a big chair for the head of the household to sit in, salt cellar to mark the head end of the table.
continue our trip through the Northeast. The next stop on our list was Vermont, specifically the idyllic town of Stowe. We stayed at the Best Western in Stowe, which may not sound like the fanciest place, but it was surprisingly festive. One of the main draws for the hotel is the covered bridge right on site. New England is known for picturesque covered bridges, and this was the first of many that we saw. Next morning, we headed towards the main area of Stowe, stopping for coffee first, of course. The city of Stowe is one of the oldest towns in Vermont, having been settled in the 1700s. It has become a winter resort town that draws visitors from all over to enjoy the incredible ski slopes in the area. It is also considered one of Vermont's most haunted cities, with multiple sightings and legends. Our next stop was the Cold Hollow Cider Mill. They are famous for their cider donuts and fresh pressed apple cider. We tried both and absolutely understand why everybody puts this on their list of must do's while in Vermont.
We had initially hoped to do a tour of the Ben & Jerry's factory, which is just outside of Stowe in Waterbury, but due to staffing issues this season, they were not open the day that we went. I'm glad we still stopped by because it was cool to see the factory from the outside and grab a photo of the classic spots. But we also had a chance to see the Flavor Graveyard, where they pay homage to all of the retired flavors. Some flavors were retired multiple times. So it says, the fla this flavor, coconut almond fudge chip meets New York super fudge chunk. So it's that one with New York super fudge chunk, which does still exist. At the end of a long day, we headed east towards our next stop in New Hampshire, but we couldn't leave without making one final stop. The Bragg Farm Sugar House has been making traditional maple syrup for over eight generations. grabbed a maple creamy, which is what they call soft serve in Vermont, and we headed the rest of the way into New Hampshire. Airbnb in Bethlehem. Mid-century A-frame was a perfect getaway in the White Mountains. There was a fully equipped kitchen and two bedrooms, but arguably the best part was the views and the surrounding fall foliage. Featured in books and magazines, this Airbnb is exactly what I imagine Airbnb was created for, sharing your unique spaces with travelers.
Why do you look like that? I'm cold. What's happening? Why is the air coming out cold? It takes the car a minute to warm up, hon. <laughs> this is a tragedy. The next morning, we set out to drive through the White Mountains on the Kankamega Scenic Byway, also known as the Kank. But first, we stopped at a local favorite, Polly's Pancake Parlor. We began our drive at the White Mountain Visitor Center, grabbing a map and learning about the do's and don'ts of the area. Do check the weather, don't feed the bears. We began our journey setting our destination as the historic covered bridge and making plans to stop along the way. We downloaded an audio guide from Action Tour Guides that gave us a history of the area as well as directing us towards points of interest to stop and hike or enjoy the view. Listen carefully for chirping or singing. 72 varieties of birds make their home here, so you should be able to spot one or two. Warblers, thrushers, and swallows are the most common. We planned our trip more than six months ago, so we had to predict when we thought the best colors would be. We decided to travel the first week of October based on last year's peaks. We may have been just slightly early, but throughout the week we were there, we definitely noticed the colors getting more vibrant. We stopped at the Sabaday Falls, one of the most popular hikes on the highway. This was a relatively quick walk, taking us only about 20 minutes each way.
Our final stop was the Albany Covered Bridge, which was first constructed in 1858. New England is known for covered bridges. The bridges were built like that to help protect them from the harsh winters in New England. Bridges built without a cover were expected to last about 20 years, while a covered bridge can last over 100 years, which the Albany Bridge is a great example of. Once we'd had breakfast, it was time for our first stop of the day. We headed to the Flume Gorge, a very popular spot for hiking in the area. Tickets can be pre-purchased online for a specific date and time. It is highly recommended to plan in advance to ensure your spot. y'all. Oh Lord. I'm going this way. The Flume Gorge is a two mile hike with just under 500 feet of elevation gain. The hike takes you through the natural gorge extending 800 feet at the base of Mount Liberty. The walls are made up of Conway granite and rise to heights of 70 to 90 feet and are 12 to 20 feet apart.
After an afternoon power nap, it was time for our ride on the Mount Washington Cog Railway. Mount Washington is the highest peak in the northeastern United States at 6,288.2 feet. You can summit Mount Washington by foot, by car, or by rail. We opted for the rail because I'm somewhat of a railroad enthusiast, and it is nice for us to both be able to enjoy the view instead of making Jeremy drive the whole time like he normally would. The black sand on the ground is just coal cinders. Uh, sometimes those, it's just like black sand. Comes, comes in through the windows. I'm getting some landing on my arm right now. You might find a little landing on your shoulder. That's totally okay. No worries. You can bring them home with you. Free souvenirs. The railway currently offers both a biodiesel train and steam engine. The biodiesel train takes about 45 minutes to climb the mountain, giving you a little more time at the top. The steam engine is slower and also makes a stop about halfway to refill with water, so the trip takes closer to an hour. Without this piece right in the middle, your two rails is just a flat steel rail and the wheel of the train is just metal. So rolling on that, you can go on a flat, but you try going uphill and that wheel is going to slip and slide like a bald tire. So that's the whole point of the cog railway. You got that gear right in the middle with those teeth being able to grab a hold of this piece in the center. It's called the cog rack, kind of like a chain. That's all the grip you need to be able to go uphill. The cool part about this place we're at right here is it was uh, patent in New Hampshire, this technology. In uh, the, the year 1866, the New Hampshire legislature uh, gave it the patent. A, uh, a man named Sylvester Marsh made it happen. He was a, a, a dude born right up here in New Hampshire. And he actually had been retired from the mechanical engineering industry.
The summit of Mount Washington has a very volatile weather system. Sometimes it can be sunny and 70 degrees at the base of the mountain and snowing at the top. Mount Washington also holds one of the highest surface wind speed records ever recorded at 231 miles per hour measured back in the 1930s. On the day we arrived in Maine, the weather was gray and gloomy, but this made for the perfect atmosphere for our first stop. We made it to our destination at the Portland Headlight on Cape Elizabeth. The Portland Headlight is one of the oldest lighthouses in Maine and is one of the most photographed lighthouses in the entire U.S.
In the parking lot of the lighthouse, you'll find a couple of food trucks to grab lunch. About five minutes. We picked Bite into Maine and got our first official New England lobster roll. Because of the weather, we retreated to our car for shelter and to enjoy our lunch seagull free. State number 25. Honestly, I can't actually believe that. How is it possible that you and I have been 25 states together? The lobster was 10 out of 10. For our accommodations, we looked for something a little unique, and we ended up at the Higgins Beach Inn. It's a historic inn, and it's only a few blocks from the ocean. The inn still keeps its historic charm with touches like real keys, no key cards, no elevator, and the doors all still have the original hardware. The next day we made our way into the city center of Portland. Our first stop for the morning was the Holy Donut to try their famous potato donuts. Next up, we headed to the pier to catch our lobster cruise for the afternoon. We booked with Lucky Catch Cruises and headed out on the water to learn more about what it takes to be a lobster fisherman. Hello? We booked these tickets well in advance because this is a very popular tour in Portland. Baked potato, or French fries, coleslaw, butter. That's the deal with the restaurant. 
<laughs> we'll do it too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Touches the tail, then the back is shorter than three and a quarter, and then it would, the lobster would be too small. Yeah. Wrap the green string. So the white's attached, it'll just drop in the cage. And then I'm going to swap with you. And you, and I'll swap with you. And you pull it up, suspend it up all on one side as high as it'll go. I think you've done this before. <laughs> wrap it around, and then wrap the white on top. And it'll hang off the edge. These are the rubber bands we're going to put on the lobster. So you guys, you see how the traps work. So these little ramps here on the side, that's where everything walks in. We were talking about those hoops being seven inches in diameter. So up here they go, and then they chew on the fish right through the bag. We saw the bag. Look, how, what, look what's left. Just bones and heads, really. And eventually, they're going to land on the floor of the trap. And from the position down there, it's hard to get back out. So they climb up the second ramp because that's the easiest path forward and then land in the back of the trap and this is the area they get caught. But you'll notice there's a slot here on the door and there's another slot at the bottom. Those are measured escape vents that by law have to be a specific width. So all the little lobsters can eat the bait and then just walk right out. Right from where? Yeah. So just right at the back of the eye. Toss it over like a hot potato. Don't want to hook it in the eye. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, yes. right okay, there. so it's the right size. Okay. So let's take a look. Is it so male it's or female? Male. Male. Great. So this is a keeper. Cool. Great. All right, we're framing that one. <laughs> good. That was good.
the end of the tour, we were able to buy a fresh caught lobster. Lucky Catch has a partnership with a restaurant on the pier, and they prepared and cooked the lobster for us right after the cruise. I'd gather to say this was probably the freshest lobster we will ever have. 